Aski Jorn is uh, one of the most dangerous artists. He's dangerous because he was a mind opener. Jorn had the idea that art is in the center of human behavior. And art was much more than painting. But of course, painting was a central part of starting to think in an artistic way. When we talk about Asker Jon today, we talk about him both as a painter and as a theorist, as a writer, and as a, an artist, a, an avant-garde artist that uses media that were not necessarily thought of as um, artistic medias at the time. When we talk about Aske Jan, we are talking about methodological aspects of how to live as an artist, how to behave as an artist, how to act as an artist in all the different, in all the different uh, relationships. He was a, an observer and a, a, permanent, a permanent acting person. When he, when he entered the room, everyone, uh, everyone understand that someone entered a room. On the one hand, he was a, a big ego. He was a bully. He was a really self-confident, macho artist who knew exactly what he wanted. And at the same time, he always wanted to collaborate. He wanted that um, constant uh, dialectics with other artists. He wanted to do um, collaborative work, but he wanted to decide how to do it. Also, the figure of two always reappears all the time. Like, like this uh, dialectical thinking comes into the painting as well as a tension between two colors or two figures or a material side of the painting and a, um, a semantic side or um, a side of the painting where the signs become uh, visible, the relationship always shifts and turns. And as, he, as we come up into the 50s, he starts criticizing this dialectical thinking. Yeah. And at the same time as the Cold War gets a grip on, uh, on also on, on the cultural life, he starts criticizing more the, the very idea of only two opposing forces. Yeah. Uh, and that's why he, he started to think of in, in a trialectic trilectical uh, way, so that instead of two points, you have three points. He gives this, uh, this picture of dialectics as a, as a match, as a football match between two teams, which will always be an aggressive force. And he then imagines a totally new play, a totally new way of playing football, where you have three teams and three goals. And of course, it will be a totally different game because the power situation is changing. One team will have the ball, they will have the power, and the two other teams will work together to get the power, to get the ball. Then when some, uh, one of the other teams gets the ball, the two others have a new relation, so the relations shift all the time. So this, the static um, ping-pong, yin-yang yeah, of, yeah. of dialectics will be um, much more fluid, and it, it will result in many different relations. And there's and no enemy. This there's is no, also important. There's no, there's no one enemy. Yeah. The, the enemy is everywhere and nowhere. It's shifting yeah. all the time. And, and you have to think in a, a spontaneous way. Um, he describes it both as more, more um, uh, dynamic, but also as a more passive uh, construction because it's not so aggressive. It's not so aggressive. Yeah. And it's, and, a, it's uh, typical for Jorn to not just play the game, but yeah. invent a totally new game or yeah. deconstruct the game that yeah. everyone else is playing. It's also a way of introducing art into the world of thought. I mean, he, he has this trilexic, the triangle of science, philosophy, and art as three um, complementary ways of thinking and three ways of dealing with the world that are um, opposed to each other. Mm. 
but still you have to, you, you have to use all of them in order to explain the world. One is not better and one is not enough. Yeah. Competition was something Jan would not discuss because that the idea of the winner was not a figure he was really uh, interested in. This is maybe also the reason I often thought about why, why we do not know if Jan, or why we know that Jan was not a chess player. Mm. Yeah. If you think about all the surrealists, Duchamp, mm -hmm. Duchamp Max Ernst, Dorothea Tanning, they were incredible good chess players. Mm. I haven't found any quote about no. chess, even if it was, it was a strategic play. Mm. He wanted to be the Spielverderber, <laughs> yeah, not yeah, the winner. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Spielverderber is a, a very nice uh, German, German uh, word, because the Spielverderber, he is a member of the game. Mm. He is a part of it. Mm. And, uh, and uh, maybe the, the, most, uh, uh, the most involved player of the game, or the, the one who has the biggest uh, uh, empathic role in a game. He is maybe the one who, 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 gives it, who, who gives it all up. The Cobra movement was founded in 1948 in Paris and Jorn had, had left Denmark after the war as soon as he could. He started um, traveling around Europe again to see what had happened during the war and he, he connected with these Dutch artists, Constant, Karl Appel, and Belgians like Christian Dautremont, the other major theorist of Cobra, along with Jorn. Um, and he found out that they had been interested in some of the same ideas, um, the theoretical ideas of Marxism, the critique of the artist as an isolated genius and the capitalist you know, producer of commodities. They wanted art to mean something more. They wanted art to have a social um, meaning to it, to have a social impact. They wanted art to enter, to activate people. Um, and they were all ready to start over after the war. So everyone who lived through the war was searching for what was the new art going to be. In France and in the U.S., they turned to abstract painting. It became very dominant. The Cobra artists weren't just interested in painting. They were interested in crossing these specialties of painting, poetry, filmmaking, photography, writing, and everybody tried all of them. Um, what distinguishes Cobra on the one hand is this interest in um, amateurism, kind of getting out of the specialization of the art world that's very, very different from what the Americans were doing at the same time. The Americans were very interested in creating, you know, painting is about painting and sculpture is about sculpture and people, we're going to be the best at it for the first time in history. Um, whereas the Cobra artists were wanting to be spontaneous and try new things and get out of their comfort zone. It was a different way of starting over. They, wanted, they were very interested in children's art and they're very interested in folk art. So both of which are, you know, seem to be closer to the roots of creativity before they get sort of distorted by the media or distorted by the institutions of the art world. Folk art, the Cobra artists believe, was a kind of true creativity that, hadn't, that, that was in its raw state. Um, folk art is often handmade and they're interested in the handmade at that point. Um, but it's also about the spontaneity and about the creativity of people the other thing that interested Cobra about folk art, it actually connects to their Marxist politics because they're always thinking socially and always interested in the artist as a part of society. So folk art always comes out of a collective context and they were very interested in that. They were gathering examples in the Cobra Journal writing about African art as folk art, you know, African wood sculpture as a kind of folk art, or folk, you know, Dubuffet's work as a kind of folk art, or folk art from Italy, folk art from Scandinavia. They're writing about all kinds of different topics um, in terms topics that they felt the mainstream art world had overlooked. So this was their way of starting over. And, you know, the Cobra artists, the movement is sometimes seen as a movement that's about little childlike forms and monsters and, you know, kind of silly little paintings. <laughs> but it's much more than that. It's much more multifaceted than that. Um, and I think that the monsters that Cobra is known, the very term Cobra comes from Copenhagen, Brussels, Amsterdam, 
but of course it's a snake symbol. The reason they picked it is because it appears in myths throughout the world, and it's universal. It's universally used as a symbol, but it's a kind of monstrous symbol. And that was also a part of their social critique, because they rejected humanism. The idea of humanism, the lineage of humanism, is about putting humans at the center and thinking that we're better than animals and that we're above animals somehow, we're more rational somehow. The Cobra artists didn't believe that. They thought that the war had proved that wrong, just like the people that lived through World War I when they saw, you know, they lived through World War II and, and didn't no longer believe that we could separate ourselves that way um, from the animals, from the rest of the world. So they, they had a much broader conception of what it meant to be human um, there was a, you know, Bjorn always talked about the human animal, that there was an animal side to humanity that was uncontrollable on some level, and it was, it also resisted control. Um, so there, this idea of folk art and little creatures and mythic themes, it also relates to their political and social critique. It's all sort of tied together. Bjorn saw Cobra as a failure, as a big failure that you can learn a lot from. Yeah. You can learn more of, of a failure than you can learn from a success. Yeah. That, that, that's the way he sort of talked about it afterwards. There's no success like uh, failure, and yeah. failure's no success no. at all. He, f he found a, a, v a very nice uh, Danish uh, motif, the Lückejul. The, in German it is called Glücksrad. It is something which turns endlessly. Mm. And of course, uh, luck and, uh, uh, is something which uh, is a construction in the 19th, 20th century, where it is said that the, the people, yeah, they, they wish each other good luck. Mm. In his way of thinking, the, the, the figure, the short form for, for human beings is in the middle and the Rue de la Fortune, the Glücksrad, is, always, is around him. He's not a part of it. Mm -hmm. He's looking at it all the time and maybe he gets a glimpse of it, but it's only for a short moment and it's nothing which you can... can uh, which you can keep for forever. You have to. You can grab the lock. Yeah. You can. He's, you can tap into the. You can to the tap into it, and he's yeah. he's in the middle of the of the of the uh, of the wheel. He is the center of the wheel, yeah. and and this the is human, a the, the human the human center being of anything. Is the, yeah. the human center, and and this is very very important that he he always believed in in the possibilities of change. Many of his ideas, he kept them for 20 and, 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 and more years and followed them and uh, worked on it. Then he stopped working on it. Then he took it again. And uh, also some of his motives of his paintings, they occur in the late 30s, early 40s. And if you see his last pictures, they are still there. And uh, so he really was acting in the center of his own wheel of life. They met in Italy in 1957 and a group of people formed this Situationist International. Guy Debord is the most well-known and people know his writing, a book called Society of the Spectacle and the film that Guy Debord made. But Jorn was a crucial theorist for this group and he has not been understood as such. Um, he contributed a lot of the discussions that ended up formula, um, formulated by Guy Debord in, as this concept of the spectacle. So the spectacle is this all-encompassing idea that visual forms dominate our lives um, in a very real political sense. So Jorn was talking in the 40, 1940s already, long before the situation's period, about advertising and the way advertising creates desire in us and it colonizes our minds. He was complaining about Rothausplatzen in Copenhagen and the way all the buildings were being covered with ads since the 1920s and 30s. Um, so he was very cognizant of these problems and how these visual forms start to oppress us in certain ways and start to create the way that we think, they shape the way that we think. And the situationists were 
interested in finding new ways to fight this that weren't just artistic. So it's a fascinating moment in Jorn's career where he's reaching out to a group of people that were very much outside the contemporary art world and set directly against it, very critical. They they wrote this journal for years that was the most um, famous aspect of their work, the journal, the theories of, you know, Internationale Situationiste in French, that was against, that, the, that said that the mainstream art world was just about spectacle. It was superficial, it was false, it was inauthentic, it pretended to be authentic, it pretended to be a, about authentic expression, but it was actually just... Um, solipsistic, you know, only speaking to the upper classes, completely cut off from everyday life. So the situation has had a series of ideas that they put forth to respond to this situation. One is the derive, which means, sort of means subversion or diversion. It's about groups of people wandering through city space, not taking photographs, not documenting it, just acting together, um, sort of under the radar of the spectacle. Um, and this was a response to a society that they viewed as dominated by images and a response to the power of images over us. They said, let's forget about images. So it's a very interesting thing for an artist to suddenly take up this, you know, get involved with. Um, this is what first fascinated me about Yarn is this, this movement that ultimately rejected art completely. Um, another, but he, as I said, he's contributing to the theory all along. He's participating in these discussions. Even after he leaves the group officially, he takes on this pseudonym, George Keller, which means, you know, the, like a seller, <laughs> like he's going underground. That was Jacqueline de Jong's idea. Um, and he's still writing for the journal and he's financing Guy Debord's films and he's financing the journal from the sale of his paintings. So he's financing these very subversive activities. Um, that are very much underground, very much on the margins of society. They become, you know, today very, you know, people sort of fetishize the situationists and they're very hip because they're, you know, they had this such a profound critique of 1950s consumer culture and the art world's role in it. The art, you know, was a luxury commodity in the Marxist sense, as they wrote in their journals. So how do you critique that from within? Jorn kept one foot in the art world and the other foot outside all the time. So I love the fact that his modifications, these were a situationist project in a sense. They were a kind of what the situation is called detournement, which means subverting, um, reusing pre-existing artistic elements to make a new work. And it's what they were doing in those artist books that I mentioned. But in the paintings, he took thrift store paintings and he painted over them. Um, this was a kind of anti-painting, you could say, from a situationist point of view. But for Jorn, it goes back to his Cobra days. It's also an homage to painting. He wrote also a small manifesto, which, started, which, which starts in the first line, uh, like uh, collectors, museums, uh, don't, be, uh, don't, don't be sad, don't be afraid. We can help you. Hmm? We will modify your works and we will refresh them. There is a new chance with your old stuff. And that is a sign that he, that he really liked the works he overpainted. He kept the signatures of the artists who had painted his structure. He kept them. In the Cobra period, 1949, he already had the idea. He wrote to Constant, let's create the section for the improvement of old canvases. Um, and he thought that Sunday painters were equally important artists as artists who were showing in the galleries, artists within the art world. He said, where everyone can be an artist that you can work within or without. And it's, all, it's the outsiders for yarn that I think the real creativity came from, the folk art. So painting on a thrift store painting is a way of engaging with folk art. It's a tribute to these non-unknown uh, artists. But it's also this situation is critique. And this is where you get into these multiple interpretations that no one dominates in Jorn's work. They're sometimes directly contradictory. And it remains, you know, for us as viewers to unlock for ourselves. It articulates a philosophy, an aesthetic philosophy, like Bachelard's, that, yeah. that um, the materiality uh, of the world affects the human way of thought that when we think about materials in the world 
it will shape our minds so that our minds will be similar to that material. And that material way of thinking and thinking about material in a, in a very artistic uh, way and at the same time in a, in a very philosophical way, I mean, that is aesthetic theory. And at, at the same time, it's an aesthetic theory that, that wants to do away with theory and have uh, the, the material as, as the ground of everything, like a, a materialist, uh, Marxist, socialist way of thinking that, that this is the, the base, the material base of, of everything. Since the mid-20s, there was the, poly the possibility to, uh, to see the Altamira uh, images. And uh, the Altamira images of the bisons and all the other things which occurred on the, on the walls was absolutely, uh, an absolutely fascinating uh, idea for all the artists who had to deal with the question how to, how to, uh, to find new ways of an old problem. What Altamira teach the artists on the first hand what was not what a better part of the public meant that the bisons they look so realistic. What Altamira teach the artists was that there was a special formation of a stone and you look at that stone with maybe a, a little fire in your hand mm. and the stone is no longer a stone, it is a, a bison. Mm. And then you only have to fix it with an eye or a, a horn or something and it, it will become alive. Mm. And this analog process to make a painting, to transform a painting into a living animal this is something which, of course, fascinated them. Then, of course, to, 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 make a, to, to turn a stone into a beast, uh, what more can you do? So the painting Stalingrad I'm going to turn to now is the perfect example of the title only captured part of a meaning or suggests a meaning and can capture the whole thing. I mean, the full title in English of Stalingrad is Stalingrad, the non... I have to get it right, actually. What is it? The non-place, um, the mad laughter of courage. These are all possible titles for Stalingrad. Um, non lu in French means non-place. The painting, he started in 1956, and the, the phrase mad laughter is scrawled on the back, and that may have been the first title, just Mad Laughter. It may have had nothing to do with the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, he eventually titled it The Retreat from Russia in Italian, and then he titled it Stalingrad and has this longer title added to it. Um, so it became a painting about the war. It became a painting about this battle, on some level about a battle in 1943 that was one of the most horrendous battles um, of modern warfare. It lasted over a year. Hundreds of thousands of people starved to death in the freezing snow in what is now Volgograd in Russia. And the Russians eventually won that battle against the Nazis. It would turn the tide of the war. It proved to the Allies that the Russians were actually on the right side, that, they were, that the Red Army was actually going to fight the Nazis and triumph. And it, and it you know, led to the eventual defeat of the Germans. Um, so Stalingrad is this incredible battle that much has been written about, and Bjorn's good friend, Umberto Gambetta, fought in that battle, and he walked home after the war, all the way from Russia, and he had this intense memory of it that he told to Bjorn around 1956-57. So he, he's working on the biggest painting of his career already. He's thinking of calling it Mad Laughter. And what that refers to, we don't know. You know, it could be, you know, it could, could be anything. Um, it was a colorful painting. He had just gotten a new studio, the biggest studio of his career, and he got the biggest canvas he could find. And he's unrolling it and painting it. His friend's telling, us, this, telling him the story of this battle. And he changes the title to The Retreat from Russia and eventually Stalingrad. Um, so the meaning of Stalingrad is already social for Jorn. It's already a dialogue with a friend, and it's about the larger culture. But what you see in Stalingrad it's a painting he worked on for almost 15 years. 
and reworked continually um, up until 1972 when he adds the black dots on the picture. The black dots look a little bit like the city of Stalingrad during the battle. If you see photographs or film footage, there are these bombed out buildings with these white buildings with black bombed out windows. So you get this ghostly presence of these buildings maybe, but they also look sort of like fingerprints. He said he wanted to paint bullets on the picture. And he said he was responding to a documentary he saw in 1972 about Stalingrad. Um, before that, how did, so how did it get from these colorful figures, these typical vivid gestural forms that he's known for, to this largely gray and white painting with these black dots on it? At a certain point in the mid-50s, a collector had it in his home and he said, it's not finished, Jorn, I want you to finish it. So this is a provocation to Jorn. He's not going to come finish the painting and make it nice. He's going to come and do something provocative. So he takes this can of khaki paint and white paint, a couple of different colors, and he covers the whole thing over, almost as if he's erasing his own prior images. So Stalingrad is a picture about erasure. You might think of it as a snowstorm. You might think of it as a nuclear winter. You can see it different ways. It's clearly kind of a landscape, and it's kind of a dominant one. It's the scale of history painting. In the 19th century, if you're going to do a battle scene, you'd have the general on the horse, and he would be the victor, and you would see clearly who is in charge and how it's going to come out. It's not like that anymore. With World War II, this is a war the likes of which we've never seen. Um, the legacy of that war is what Jorn's more concerned with, in fact, than the battle itself. So when he talked about Stalingrad, he said he, he was referring to the Cold War. He was referring to the threat of nuclear annihilation, that this was the most tragic and violent you know, series of events the world has ever seen. So, in fact, it has these multiple layers of meaning that are embedded in the multiple layers of the process itself. Um, erasure becomes an action. The way in the modifications, painting is a verb. Painting becomes a form of graffiti. In Stalingrad, he's doing graffiti on his own prior painting, and he's erasing his own prior gesture. So he's, there's a sense of loss that you get from, that one feels in front of that painting. There's a whole range of responses you might have, but the sense of loss is palpable because of this feeling that the image had been, has been taken away. It's also a situationist response, this situationist idea that images dominate us and that images are false. The images of victorious battles that we see in film primarily, in photography in the 20th century, these are the media that capture history now. And Jorn gives us instead the withdrawal of those images. So there can't be a victor. In a nuclear war, there is no victor. Um, so it's fascinating to me that when he talked about it, um, he was responding to current events in the 1950s, not just the past of the war. He's not looking back at the war and thinking nostalgically about it. He's doing it a painting about a Soviet victory just after the Soviets had invaded Hungary in 1956. So the Soviets were not something that people were celebrating in the West anymore. Um, communism had been called into question with its violence, which was, very, which was still going on, which is very contemporary. So Stalingrad, I think, speaks to wars that are going on today. When I look at Stalingrad, I think of what's happening right now today in Syria, in Afghanistan. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that it opens up. So the idea of stop calling it Stalingrad, he takes the title of this battle, but you could substitute almost any battle. You know, you could substitute any tragedy, any massive human violence, you know, event of human violence. This is also a wonderful aspect of, of Jorn, that he, uh, uh, that he was this, uh, this crazy wisdom uh, thinker. Uh, who was eating information and images all the time, but he was not only eating them, he was uh, transforming, transforming them. them and spying them out again and was confronting everyone with his ideas and his trans already transformed images. The Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism is a, an institute that Jon uh, founded just after leaving the Situationist, and it's a fantastic title. Um, the, the comparative vandalism was referring to the method he used when he collected thousands of photographs 
from all over Europe, taken from churches, from the inside and outsides of churches and of sculptures, of uh, murals all over Europe, of um, the Nordic uh, tradition. So the Scandinavian Institute of Artistic Vandalism also wasn't just a response to his Jorns coming back to Denmark and leaving the SI and leaving the French art world and all of its polemics behind. I think it also drew on 20 years of his artistic practice and investigations with Pave Globe, the archaeologist um, in Denmark, who he had founded Hal Heston with in 1941. And even earlier than that, even going back to the 1930s when Jorn was looking at the Surrealist journals, um, surrealism at the service of revolution and revolutionary surrealism, Minotaur, these journals in the 30s that came out of France, they juxtaposed art from around the world, you know, with contemporary art at the time. And Jorn was already thinking about non-Western art and ancient Danish art, ancient art around the world. Um, he was investigating it for, for his entire career, so publishing articles about it. With Pave Globe in Denmark, they tried to do a book called Old Danish Art, and they realized, I think, at some point along the way that this was problematic because what is Denmark when you're talking about prehistory or Viking culture? So they gave up the project, but they had materials they had gathered, and those went into the Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism. It was something he was thinking about continually, even as he was abroad doing paintings, doing ceramics, writing aesthetic books, all of these things he's doing at the same time. So it comes that it becomes an institute in the 1960s, a very playful take on an institute. Um, but it's already drawing on 20 years of investigation. And it's, I think the SICV, as we call it in English, is one of the most contemporary aspects of Jorn pra Jorn's practice. It's been overlooked because he's been seen more as a painter, but he's acting essentially as a conceptual artist, doing these artist books as an editor. He's also acting as an art historian we have many models for this type of practice in contemporary art, where artists are coming in as curators and rearranging a museum collection. Artists are working in teams with other people and collaborating to produce a book or a website or a kind of you know, information graphic or whatever it is. So Jorn pioneered these practices in this amazing project that only lasted a few years, but the books are actually still being published. The books are still being translated into English and you know, they appeared in multiple languages, so it's, it's really an ongoing investigation. If you look at the photographs of Jorn from the early days of the Institute, going around Europe, photographing with Franceschi and Ulrich Ross and his assistants and Jacqueline de Jong and anyone else who wanted to come, they were going around everywhere, all over Europe, taking photographs, and it was constantly traveling, gathering these images that have been overlooked, and he's responding to art history, in, especially in France, that had always marginalized Nordic art. They didn't think the Vikings had a culture. They didn't think the Vandals had a culture. And he takes this idea of vandalism and the play on words with the Vandals because he says that they had you know, this very, very rich collective culture and imagery, animal interlace, all kinds of different aspects that he underlines in the project. Um, and he starts investigating it, but the Institute doesn't have an office, you know, so they're going around Sokoborg, there's photographs of them with boxes of photographs and camera equipment, and they're going to this little office they finally rented above a photography studio, um, and then they eventually move it into the museum, and now it sits in the basement as an archive full of photographs, but really where it is, is potentially anywhere, because they're drawing on, they're responding to this idea of the imaginary museum by Andre Malraux, and his this French art writer who did these books in the 50s called the Musée Imaginaire. And this is the, it's the idea of photography that liberates us from locating art in any one place. All of a sudden, with photographs of artworks, you can look at them anywhere. It can be a book. Jorn wanted to place the books in every library in Scandinavia. He sent one to each of the three monarchs of Scandinavia when he finished the first book. Um, I don't know if they ever responded. He sent them to George Kubler. He sent in the U.S., the famous art historian. He sent them all over the world um, because they could be anywhere. So he could take Scandinavian art and investigate it with this collective of people he worked with, ethnographers, archaeologists, art historians, scientists, poets, everybody who wrote in these books and then accompanying these photographs. It could go anywhere. So where it is, is continually changing.